at this point, if you follow content creation on YouTube or pretty much any digital source, it's quite clear that the DJI Osmo Pocket 3 is being put to use for many different types of applications. And one of those is really starting to take a step forward with a brand new lens attachment from Newer. It's their anamorphic lens, and I'm gonna go through it today. Stick around, this is gonna be a fun one. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to a gal in customer service at Newer. Her name's Mary, and she helped me get through uh, what seemed like an endless journey of this lens from the day it was released till the day I actually got it. So newer customer service based out of their offices in, in Asia, they they listen, they get back to you. Uh, I, I just wanted to give them a shout out. Also, this video is not sponsored by newer. Uh, I have a lot of newer products here and I enjoy using their products because they are a great value for the price and they do exactly what you expect of them. So huge shout out to Newer, and uh, yeah, let's get rolling with the review. You know, one of the things I don't really make a secret of here is that I really do have an affinity for this guy, the DJI Osmo Pocket 3. It is a cool little camera. It does a lot for both live streaming and for just taking content, vlogging, whatever. Uh, when you're using Ecamm, one of the nicest things that you can have at your disposal is quick B-roll material or just video content that you can quickly add to Ecamm and enhance your presentation. Also, because it is a webcam, you can use this as your main camera when you're doing your Ecamm presentations as well. So it's a cool little tool. I started to look around as far as like other things that I could do with it. I mean, I've lots of people have done tons of stuff with it and there are dozens and dozens of videos out there that show, you know, six months later, four months later, is it still worth it? And I would say that if anything, for a lot of people, just getting our hands on one was dang near impossible. So now they're becoming more and more available and I was able to get my hands on one a couple of months ago and I've been playing with it almost daily ever since. And I really do enjoy using it. Now, it's not gonna replace your mirrorless camera that you're using in your studio, kind of like what I'm talking to you on right now. Will it do a good job? Yes but there's really just no replacement for a large sensor with a nice lens. You just can't, there's only so much you can do with a tiny little sensor. You simply can't do on the Osmo that you can do with say, you know, like what I have the Sony FX30. So that said, what kinds of things would it be useful for? And I was recently browsing the newer website. I noticed that they were just on the cusp of releasing a anamorphic lens attachment for the Pocket 3. It is a, it's a 1.2 times zoom and it's optical. It's not digital. So you're getting more information into that sensor, but of course you have to deal with the, the anamorphic distortion after the fact, but it can be done. And it's something that I thought, oh, well, let's give this a try. So let's take a look. I got a day, daytime example with the car lights on because it was crappy weather. It is Seattle after all, but I got enough video footage, both daytime, also nighttime. And this allowed me to test in multiple frame rates. So when you go into night mode, for instance, you will have a fixed frame rate that you can record at. And so you lose some of the capabilities, but at the benefit, I guess, the gain of taking better images at nighttime. So they both have their place. And I just want to show you some examples. And then also, finally, what does it do to an image? So we're going to look at some tests of I'm just going to take a photo with and without the lens against the test pattern, and you can see the differences. So let's go over first and take a look at the video footage. Okay, so this was quite literally right outside of my house on the road. Uh, this was about, oh, I don't know, four o'clock, so in the afternoon. So I'm just going to kind of scrub through while well, I can play here. You can see. 
And see, I, I, I kind of slowed it down here, but you can see how the, the beams come through. And it's pretty interesting, actually, the, the, the way that the beams are formed. It seems like it's honing in on the most intense light sources, and it's maintaining them pretty much all the way through. So here I sweat it up back to regular time and you can see this is this is full speed. And again, it depends on the light source. So a lot of cars have different headlights and you know they all have multiple lights and sometimes it'll key off of all the lights that are inside the housing. And then sometimes it won't. It, it just really depends on the way that that light is diffused and picked up by the lens. So this is this is actually nighttime. I went to a traffic circle, roundabout, whatever you want to call it, not too far from my house in the evening. And aside from the fact that the Osmo Pocket 3 does a phenomenal job at nighttime, that coupled with the anamorphic lens... I mean, you can see right here, you can see you've got this this portion, you know, you can see you got a little uh, flare up here and then you've got another one just off screen here. And of course the one coming over from the car. So if I press play, and so to get focus on this, I just picked a manual point. So you can see like right about where the car comes into the traffic circle is where it's focused. I've found that at nighttime, if you set a focal point in, instead of, trying to get it to focus in and out. You're, you won't have to worry about blurry images. It'll get blurry, and it'll get sharp and get blurry again. And here you can see I go pan up, and then I kind of come back down just to see what that does. And, you know, for the most part, it's doing its job. Now, notice right here that even though I'm, I'm not getting any kind of you know, highlight off of the tail lights there. They do have a little bit of glow to them. And I'm not really sure if that's related to focus because you can see up front here, this, you can see the gravel on the road. Uh, that is, or the asphalt, the details of the asphalt. So maybe this is where I'm focused more than anything else. And that's too far in the distance for it to work. And of course, yeah, you can see here the way that this one works. You get, you get these really interesting, I moved over a little bit here, and what I was trying to do here was get at what point does the light kind of break. And from what I can tell, if you look at the, the car here, the, the passenger side lights, passenger side in the U.S., the, those lights uh, are mostly occluded at this point, where the light source is occluded and what you're getting is the glow from the housing. So you can see right there, as soon as that's occluded, it goes away. And same thing with the, the other lights. You can see it's roughly the same angle. So the lens appears to be doing its job. Now I had a spot here, there you go. See right here, can you see that? There's just a bit of beam coming through here. So even though the light is not focused on the camera lens, it's still picking up something and it's generating one of those blue streaks. And of course in the background, that car that's coming in, once the lights are occluded, that streak goes away and then it comes right back. So it's usually, I mean right there, you're gonna get it and then but you can see that that's superimposed over the car. So the lens flare effect itself is occurring. At, of course, it's occurring at the lens. And so it will appear in front of anything between the light source and your lens. You can see, I think that, yeah, that's a caddy right there. You can see, look at, look at all that. Notice that there's a Boeing here too. Not an airplane Boeing, but the Boeing of the, the beam itself. And that is in relation of where the the camera lens is to the light source. Notice this one, uh, that's a Nissan, probably Murano or something like that, that's in the distance there. But you see that, that occlusion to the light source really cuts out those beams really quick. Here the car stops 
and you can see we got another one coming through and that one's not really generating much at all so you can see that doesn't really do much of anything here more even more just so if i had had that camera up just a little bit higher for you can see that the the light source itself is actually um, actually it's below the camera so it's bowing up so and here i just thought i'd show this this is a this is an interesting effect in that it you can see how the the beam is not nearly as intense on the street light here or in the parking lot light but as you get further into it so like you go right here but you can see how that flare effect works and then look at that one light source off to the right there you see that see how as i move kind of interesting huh so there's that um i believe i have some shot from the studio yeah i do i have inside the studio here so this you can see the it the focus is real nice but you can also see off to the side here it gets blurry as these things come in to center frame they also come into focus whereas off to the right there you can see that they're definitely not in focus so the the numbers on the the calculator app for instance and yeah, this is all what's behind me right now. And then I came in, and this is just a, a wall washer, and you can see what that does right there. So that gives you an idea of the effect. Notice that I'm pretty much level with that wall washer, and my beam, while intense, is almost straight across. And that's the effect of what happens when you go a little bit below. See how it bows up. All right, so then let's take a look at the test patterns real quick just to see what happens. And so this is a pattern, and I snapped a shot of it. I printed it out on the printer, snapped a shot of it, and this is what I got. So you can see that my printer ink or my nozzles are way out of whack. So those black streaks that are in um, in here, those <laughs> it's not supposed to be like that. So go over into well this little uh, you can see that the circle is perfect right the circle is perfect and if i um zoom in on that you can see that you know for the most part it's in focus right now if i go over to the this is the image created with the anamorphic lens attached and we'll zoom in on the same area this is the this is the anamorphic and then this is the normal photograph. So you can see there there is a, a distinct difference in focal, focal response with the two different lenses. So this is the DJ, you know, obviously with the way the Pocket 3 works, the lens, the, the anamorphic lens is sitting on top of this lens, this, this first lens that we were looking at here. So now it's this one. There we go. So, you know, when you when you add another lens on top of it, you run the risk, obviously, of there being some focal uh, issues. But you really start to notice it at the edges. And let's go ahead and zoom in here. First of all, look at look at this portion here. You can see that's not a solid square. And if I type in the same thing here, 25%, you can see that that is very much a solid square. So go back, see that, that there's, there's virtually, and then another thing, the, the reason for the grid pattern to check the level of distortion. There is virtually no distortion on this image, whereas this image, you can see it's already, let me uh, zoom out here. So you can see the, the distortion level, um, and then just the way, the way that the image looks between the two. The circles are circles, the squares are squares when they're not bowing, but the, uh, I used uh, Lightroom to correct the anamorphic squeeze that was occurring in this particular example 
and it, I did a pretty good job, but I'm not an expert at that. I, I just know that when I was looking at like footage like this, I could see, I could, you can see right there the, the way the telephone pole is and particularly the utility pole. See right along here, this one right here, see how it's bowing. Yeah. So you getting the distortion there. And then also, um, I don't know if I, can I zoom in? Yes, I can. So let's uh, see if we can zoom in here. So you can see the, the cone here is pretty crisp, but I get off to the side here. And you can see back there. Now, again, th this is because I set the focal point where I did, but um, you can also see that as I get, you know, more center screen here, the vehicle is is much more in focus than if I were to say, and let's see if we can get catch him as he gets to the edge of the frame. And yes, it was raining. Oh, look at that. I didn't even notice that before. But, you know, motion blur aside, I should have, I was capturing this at 100 and uh, 1 and 1 20th frames per second, the shutter speed. I should have gotten that license. And I I can't. There's no way. Because <laughs> uh, you see, it just gets more and more blurry as it gets towards the edge of the lens. So that's a combination of where I set the focal point plus the lens itself. So I, I you know, I, I don't want to harp on this because the lens does what it does and anamorphic lenses tend to be this way. So, um, it, it's just the, you know, it's kind of the way things work. It, it, the, but the, I think the key is you go back to looking at the footage and rather than having focusing on this let's go back to that nighttime scene right and look at that i mean that just looks it looks good and you put it you know you put it in motion you get those lens flares happening plus the, the beam across it's a really cool cinematic effect and the aspect ratio that exists here inside the ecam window is the aspect ratio of the video so you can see it is much wider than it is tall so uh the the file size is actually it can get quite large if you keep it at the aspect ratio so you have to in order to fix this you need to actually de-squeeze the image and de-squeezing involves scaling it in this case uh let me see i'll uh, you know what let me pull up a uh, final cut and i'll show you all right, so you can see here I'm in Final Cut. And with uh, Final Cut, if I take a look at this clip here, what I'm just showing you is when I bring the footage in, it'll be whatever resolution I'm recording at. So if it's 4K, then uh, 3840 by 2160. And so when the, when the file comes through, 3840 by 2160. Right, this is what's going to come in. That's what it'll come in at. And my project is, let's see, this is untitled. So I'm going to go to untitled. My untitled is set to 4608 by 2160. So why did I do that? Well, so what I'm trying to do is I want to scale the image uh, or scale the, the, the workspace for the project laterally along the x-axis first times the the factor the zoom factor of the lens so in this case it's 1.2 3840 times 1.2 means 4608 which is the resolution of this particular project but the images are recorded at 3840 by 2160 but they're squeezed so to de-squeeze them, you have to actually make them the width of the project itself, which is a factor of 1.2. So 
under normal circumstances, something like this, you can see it'll come in at 100%. And if you look very carefully, it's kind of hard to see because it's nighttime, but you know, let's go to back to our daytime scene here. That might be a little bit easier to see. Uh, go back to that, there we go. And you can see I've already scaled it, but this is what it would come in as. Now look what's happened. Everything is squeezed up, right? Those cars are squeezed, right? And that's not the look that we want, obviously. So you can also see that in the frame here, on the left and right side, there are black bars. We don't want those. So we'll go ahead and set these, set the scale on X to 120 and then bam. And now what we have is the right aspect ratio for this particular image. And same thing happens over here. You can set, you just set all of your images to 120%. Now you want non-uniform scale, meaning don't mess with the y-axis. Only mess with the x-axis when you're sizing these up. But then once you do that, you'll have a nicely sized image. And then of course you'll have at this point, uh, let me go back to here and we'll switch this back over to our QuickTime player. That's what it should look like. And you know, my, my circles, especially like right around here, that you want to make sure is nice and circular because if it's not, then you know that you've got issues with your sizing. So that's, that's how you do it. When you bring in your footage, let's say you do a 3840 by 2160, you do a normal 4K image and a normal 4K project. What you're gonna have to do is reduce the Y axis, not the X. You leave the X alone and you squish the Y axis. You, you basically go by, in this case, this particular lens is 1.2. Sometimes it's 1.33, sometimes it's 1.55, but in this lens's case, it's 1.2. So in the case of Final Cut, if I were to do a new project, right? So I'm gonna go File, Project, and I'm going to make it a 4K image, and da, 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 leave everything as is, 24P, that's good, and then do OK. So now what I have is I still have all my footage here, which is stuff that I imported, right? But this is, and this is recorded at 3840 by 2160, right? The problem is you can see right there, um, that truck is kind of squished. So if I were to bring this into the final cut now, into the project, it looks exactly like it did before, right? But it's now tall. So what you would do is you'd scale Y down to 0.8 because it's, again, it's a 1.2 lens, scale it down to 80%. And now you can see what, what's happened here. Um, you've got, it's kind of, again, it's kind of hard to see, but there you can see here is the black boxes. Right along here is a black box. You can see where the actual frame ends right here at the end of these horizon points. So that's the edge of the frame. So now what I've got is a black box. So if I were to bring in that kind of footage, it, it, and let's say I wanted to give the cinematic look, but I wanted to keep it 4K. So, you know, I wanted to have it the 3840 by 2160. You could still leave that, but then instead of you know pulling it out this way to fit the frame because you've scaled the frame already in the project, you would do it in the file and then you would be left with bars. So, I mean, of course you could crop it and all that other fun stuff, but then what's the fun in that? You, you're kind of losing the effect. And this is not faux bars, right? This is not the bars that you would see somebody like lays them in to give it at cinematic look. No, this is the real deal. 
This is exactly what, you know, you're dealing with when you're editing cinematic shots. So that is it. That's how you do it. So as you can tell, this little lens attachment actually does do quite a bit to enhance the image of your Pocket 3, far beyond what it can do out of the box. And I think there's definitely some applications where this would be useful, especially when you're creating content like cinematic footage or footage where you want it to be kind of epic. You know, this is a great lens attachment to add to the Pocket 3. It, it, it does have limited usage, though, because of some of the things that we saw. For instance, the, uh, the distortion in the corners and the lack of focus, which is not necessarily DJI's fault. This is kind of symptomatic of most uh, anamorphic lenses. I mean, it, it, let's face it, it's a $50 to $60 lens attachment. It's not going to be, you know, a multi-thousand dollar anamorphic lens that you would put onto a mirrorless. It's, it, for what it costs, it does a pretty good job but it's not necessarily going to be useful in every situation. So what's nice about it is because it is a attachment, you can just take it on and off as needed. I will caution you that the magnets are not that strong on this particular attachment, and I'm not sure why. I would have preferred to see stronger magnets on it so that it would stay in place. Yeah, I've, I had it fall off a couple of times. Now, granted, I was being rough with it, but... I have other lens attachments that I've used that have been, yeah, I've been equally rough with and they've stayed on. So I'm not really sure if this is just this symptomatic with this particular lens attachment or not. It just, just be mindful of the fact that it's there and make sure to check that it's always there if you fold it up. Also, because of the way that the lens uh, size is, you can see it will prevent your gimbal from fully closing, right? So you can see here, this is what the attachment on, get it closer to my face. And if I try to rotate closed, that's not gonna happen, right? Because if you see where it's going right there, it won't go past this point. You pull this guy off and it'll close up like it's supposed to. So just keep that in mind is that you have to take this off if you want the gimbal to be protected, be able to put it back in its protect. Lastly, make sure to keep it clean because of the focal issues at the corners or at the edges, you're going to exasperate things if you don't keep it clean. And because they include that little microfiber cloth, use it before you use it. And after you use it, just wipe it down and you should be good to go. All right. Well, that wraps it up. If you have any questions, drop them below. I'll be more than happy to answer what I know about it at this point. Go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button on the, your way out. I would really appreciate it. And uh, also make sure to check out our training series at Basecamp.pro. We've got a lot of great tutorials there. In addition to this one, we have other tutorials that we put up there that we don't put on YouTube. And we have a full course. If you're just getting started with Ecamm, we have the boot camp available right now. And you can get that. And it's basically a self-paced, about 16-hour course that will take you through the, uh, the ins and outs of Ecamm and get you fully proficient at the product as quickly as possible. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for joining me. And I'll talk to you soon.